of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19. Honorable Ministers, members of the Presidential Task Force, Nigerians watching this program from home and from your offices, gentlemen of the press, welcome to the national briefing for Monday, 29th June, 2020. Particularly to our colleagues, welcome back from the dry run in Lagos, and we thank God for Johnny Messis. This afternoon's national briefing is uh, going to be slightly modified uh, because a lot of messages will be conveyed. So what we'll do today is to have the chairman, invite the chairman of the Presidential Task Force and Secretary to Government of the Federation to deliver his remarks. Thereafter, the national coordinator will expand on certain areas, especially the guidelines that will be unveiled uh, today. The second segment will be the question session when we'll take questions from you before we invite ministers, if questions are directed at them, to respond accordingly. So this afternoon, I now invite the chairman of the Presidential Task Force and Secretary to Government of the Federation to the podium to make his remarks. Mr. Chairman, sir. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, let me once more welcome you all to the national briefing by the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 for Monday, 29 June 2020. When the Presidential Task Force briefed the nation on 1st June 2020, we informed you that Mr. President had approved, amongst others, that we should proceed into the second phase of eased lockdown for a period of four weeks to enable the Presidential Task Force to evaluate the developments properly and continue to ensure balance between lives and livelihood. We also cautioned that the gradual relaxation was subject to review should developments warrant it. Within the month under review, the Presidential Task Force continued to monitor developments and consequently admonish Nigerians to change their behavior in view of the fact that the spread of the virus had entered the community phase. It is the considered opinion of the PTF that Nigerians, though aware of the existence of the virus, have generally misunderstood the objectives behind the reasoning of government in gradually relaxing the restrictions. For the purpose of uh, emphasis, the virus is still dangerous and has continued to wreak havoc at home and abroad. The exponential rise in number of cases detected and the fatalities give cause for concern. Statistically, the following numbers should interest us all. Let me give you a picture globally as well as what is available on the African continent and the Nigerian situation as of 27th June 2020. The total number of confirmed cases globally amount to 10,129,054. The same number of confirmed cases on the African continent stand at 375,390,000. ,390, and the Nigerian statistics is 24,077. In the same vein, fatalities globally stand at 502,189, while on the African continent is 9,229. And the Nigerian fatalities stand at 
than uh, 558. Similarly, there are also figures for recoveries. But the figure that would interest you is that in the recent spike in daily numbers, 125,039 reported in the US on the 26th of June 2020, while the highest figure recorded in Nigeria was 779 on the 27th of June 2020. This gives you the global picture of where we start in the pandemic as of now. But we also need a statistical comparison between the exact dates in the months of May and June 2020 so that you can have a better understanding of the dangers that the pandemic or COVID-19 portents. Within the same period, on the 28th of May 2020, confirmed cases globally stood at 5.5 million plus. Deaths were 353,000 plus. On the African continent, that figure stood, confirmed cases stood at 89,000 plus, while in Nigeria it stood at 8,915. This was on the 28th of May 2020. In Nigeria, at that time, we had 259 fatalities. Within a period of one month, that's on the 20. 27th of June 2020. Look at the figures globally. On that day, the figure globally stood at 10,186,375 with over half a million fatalities. On the African continent, it jumped from 89,000 plus to 383,000 plus with a fatality of over 9,000. Uh, similarly, in Nigeria, on the same day, June 27th, our figure jumped from the, day, from the figure of 28th May, which was 8,915, to 24,077 with 558 fatalities. This gives you a picture of the manner in which this virus has spread all over the world on the African continent and in Nigeria. Another statistic that will help you have a good appreciation of what is confronting us as a nation is the daily reported statistics in Nigeria from 18th to 27th of June 2020. In all of these 10 days, eight out of the 10 days numbered exceeded, numbers exceeded 500. Of the 10 days, on each of these days, eight of each of these days, we had a figure of over 500. That's a deliberate sign and a factual indication that our figures are spiking and are rising. The second thing that will be of note and concern to us is that for every de detected case, there is a high possibility that up to five have not been submitted to testing and therefore not detected. That presupposes that on a day that you have 500, the likelihood is that you might have missed at least 2,500. I believe 
if you do a rough mental addition, you will know that the figure we have now might not actually be what is evident in ground or on ground in our communities. As we are all aware, the Presidential Task Force in conjunction with the sub-national entities, the organized private sector, put in place a number of measures. The Presidential Task Force also escalated its activities around risk communication to Nigerians, but we have observed with growing concern the non-compliance with these measures designed to prevent transmission and protect the vulnerable segment of the population. We hold a strong view that if such actions do not abate, experiences of resurgence of the virus from other jurisdictions, including China, the United States of America, Brazil, and across Europe, may emerge in Nigeria, and we run the risk of erasing the gains made in the last three months. By way of a reminder, there is presently no known vaccine for the virus, and that all over the world, non-pharmaceutical measures still remain the most effective fighting opportunity we have for overcoming this pandemic. To further strengthen our response, the Presidential Task Force in the intervening period vigorously built partnerships locally and internationally. Similarly, we fully have decentralized the national response with state governments and communities taking ownership and more responsibility. These efforts have greatly improved our ability to maximally de detect, trace, isolate, and treat nationwide successfully. The Presidential Task Force has also continued to pursue the strategic trust of telling, that's communicate, tracing, identify, treating, that's managing cases with a stronger focus on precision interventions in the high burden local governments within identified states of the Federation. This precision intervention will be signed posted by one, aggressive scaling up of efforts to ensure effective community protection and sensitization, and two, increased provision of support and guidance to states in their response to the outbreak. Ladies and gentlemen, the focus on the important roles to be played by the states is underscored by the following considerations. One, the spread has entered the community phase, which only states and the local governments should drive. The inaction, two, the inaction of a particular state could endanger its neighbors and compromise the entirety of the response. Three, states will be encouraged to make considerable efforts to ensure a push for compliance with the guidelines issued by the Presidential Task Force. And four, states must also take greater care in leading on public health measures in the local governments under their jurisdictions by working on surveillance, case finding, testing, isolation, tracing, and quarantining contacts, and five. The federal government will predicate its resource deployment to states on the level of compliance and the extent of collaboration received on this public health emergency. Notwithstanding the challenges faced in the last one month and the fact that Nigerians' statistics have been on the rise, substantial progress has been made in the following areas. One, harnessing of data which shows that 60% of the confirmed cases are in a handful of local governments in the country. 18 out of 774 local governments nationwide and putting in place targeted interventions. Two, increase capacity to detect, test, and trace those infected with the virus 
through the activation of 38 molecular testing laboratories, resulting in the, uh, raising the test count nationwide in excess of 130,000. Three, a shift in focus to a targeted community-based approach enhanced race communication. Four, increased collaboration with the legislature, state governments, and the organized private sector. Five, activation of a new cost-effective policy on the evacuation of returning Nigerians. And six, increased awareness of COVID-19 among the population. Seven, cushioning the socioeconomic impact of the restrictions through the provision of palliatives to the vulnerable members of our various communities nationwide. And eight, successful reopening sectors of the economy despite initial challenges in areas such as banking sector, industry, and agriculture. Today, the presidential staff has submitted its fifth interim report to Mr. President for his consideration. In the report, the PTF specifically reviewed the issues around the general level of compliance with prescribed measures while taking note of the following. One, implication of the lack of general compliance with measures. Two, the global and domestic developments, especially in the area of rising statistics. And three, the continued restriction in the education and transportation sectors as well as for activities that attract mass gatherings, such as operations of market, places of worship, and entertainment. In doing the foregoing, the PTF considered the need for the continuation of the policy of striking the delicate balance between lives and livelihood, as well as inputs received from different stakeholder groups. The Presidential Task Force similarly identified the underlisted areas of concern that will require attention under the ongoing restrictions. One, international travels, two, entertainment activities, three, education services, stroke sector, and lastly, four, public and private sector offices. You will recall that the presidential task force had in the previous briefings stated that the aim of the phase two was to sustain the gains from earlier steps taken for pandemic control and to enable additional sectors of the economy restart activities. Given the challenges and the visible danger ahead occasioned by skepticism and poor public perception, both leading to lack of compliance, it has come to the inevitable conclusion that the extension of the phase two of the eased lockdown will be needed to one, consolidate the gains in the areas of the economy that have restarted. Two, ensure better compliance with the health-based response. Three, support the states in enforcing guidelines and protocols, as well as strengthening the local governments, build community-level structures for ownership and effective risk communication. And four, help to better achieve the balance between saving lives and ensuring the well-being and livelihoods of citizens are protected. I am pleased to inform you that Mr. President has carefully considered the fifth interim report of the PTF and has accordingly approved that, with the exception of some modifications to be expatiated upon later, the phase two of the eased lockdown be extended with another four weeks with effect from Tuesday, June 30th, 2020, through midnight of Monday, 27th July, 2020. Specifically, however, the following measures shall remain, shall either remain in place or come into effect. One, maintaining the current phase of the national response for another four weeks in line with modifications to be expanded upon by the national coordinator. Two, permission of movement across state borders only outside coffee hours 
with effect from 1st July 2020. Three, enforcement of laws around non-pharmaceutical intervention by states, in particular, the use of face masks in public places. Four, safe reopening of schools to allow students, only students in graduating classes, resume in person for preparation for examinations. Five, safe reopening of domestic aviation services as soon as practicable. Six, publication of revised guidelines around the three thematic areas of general movement, industry and labor, and community activities. Six, uh, seven, provision of technical support for states to mobilize additional resources for the response. Eight, strengthening partnerships with states, local governments, traditional rulers, community and religious leaders, and civil society to ensure increased public awareness and compliance with preventive guidelines. Nine, encourage state governments to empower local government authorities to intensify contact tracing efforts and ensure stronger grassroots mobilization to support the response. 10, encourage states and hospitals, authorities to particularly ensure continuity of other health services to prevent fatalities from other life-threatening conditions during the COVID-19 pandemic. And 11, deepening of collaboration with other man groups at state and federal levels to harmonize the country's COVID-19 response in the short, medium, and long terms. The national coordinator would in due course announce and publish the details of the revised guidelines while the relevant MDAs, including education, transportation, and aviation will respectively consult further with stakeholders and issue guidelines for their sectors. The presidential task force will now, after further briefings or expansion by the national coordinator, will be ready to take your questions. I want to thank you for listening. At the chairman of the presidential task force, um, honorable ministers, uh, members of the PTF, uh, gentlemen of the press, um, good evening. So um, I'll be taking you through uh, some of the changes. As the chairman said, uh, we are extending phase two of the response with slight modifications. The PTF has identified uh, certain areas of concern that require attention and which will undergo uh, further revision. These are particularly uh, areas involved with um, international air travel, entertainment activities, educational sector services, and public and private sector services. The PTF in the past has stated that the aim of phase two was to sustain the gains from earlier steps and phases in terms of the pandemic control. It's also important to state that we relax the response partly to enable additional sectors of the economy restart activities. In this regard, we seek to consolidate the gains in the areas of the economy while trying to ensure better compliance with the health-based response. Specifically, therefore, the following areas will be sustained and or modified under the extended phase of the eased lockdown as approved by Mr. President. The current nationwide curfew will remain. We will maintain restrictions on mass gatherings and sporting activities. Domestic aviation services will recommence. Movement across state boundaries will be allowed, but only outside curfew hours. Students in graduating classes, only graduating classes, primary six, JS3, and SS3 will be allowed to resume in preparation for examinations. Federal and state government offices will maintain their current timing with only essential staff allowed at the same level of grade level 14 and above to resume work. 
the use of face masks remains mandatory and we will be enforcing this at all levels, including linking up with state governments. Access to government and commercial premises will not be allowed if you are not wearing a face mask. In other words, no mask, no entry. No mask, no services will be provided in government premises and commercial premises. I'll now briefly take you through some of the changes in greater detail. Some haven't changed that much. So the curfew, for instance, remains at 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. nationwide. People are allowed to go out for work and to buy necessary food and exercise, as well as um, uh, continuing to move between local governments, um, especially in areas that are not high burden local governments. But we still strongly recommend avoiding unnecessary contact with people. For the aviation industry, the aviation industry is allowed to resume domestic operations as soon as practicable in line with existing international and local guidelines on COVID-19. For interstate travel, movement across state borders will be allowed only outside curfew times effective from the 1st of July to allow the industry to prepare over the next 24 hours. In particular, we expect the transport industry to adhere to the Federal Ministry of Transportation safety protocol and guidelines that will be released, specifically in relation to parks and terminals that will be restricted access with disinfection and sanitization Waiting areas for passengers must have social distancing measures. There has to be posters and notices on conduct of persons. Temperature checks. If you are not wearing a mask, you will not be allowed entry into the parks and terminals. We also expect transporters to arrange for crowd control. Buses should have a maximum of 50% capacity. Bus, for bus trips, we strongly urge windows to be kept open, particularly for short trips, and face mask is mandatory. State governments through their commissioners of transport shall undertake inspection of facilities and confirm compliance as a precondition to resumption of intrastate, interstate uh, travel. And non-compliance with the guidelines will result in withdrawal of permission to operate interstate mass transit. The PTF expects this to be enforced at the state level. For interstate travel, we will maintain the occupancy level for buses to 50% and two passengers for taxis, but we will re restrict movement in high burden local government areas to essential travel only. This will be part of the hotspot strategy that will be introduced. For industry and labor, uh, we'll maintain normal working hours based on the curfew arrangements apart from government offices that will have a separate um, working hour schedule. And, but offices must maintain working at 75% capacity. For banks and financial institutions, they will operate normal working hours with no change. For government offices, there is no specific change. Working hours remain 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, from grade level 14 and above. For personalized services, mechanics, artisans, hair saloons, etc., who own their workshops or workstations and can clearly adhere to non-pharmaceutical interventions will be permitted to operate as normal. Uh, in, for markets, there is no specific change to what we already have in phase two. And this will be driven by local authority arrangements. For hotels, restaurants, and eateries, uh, there is no specific change. Hotels 
must observe all mandatory non-pharmaceutical interventions, restaurants to remain closed for eat-in with strict cleanliness guidelines, except for restaurants that are serving hotel residents. Bars, gyms, cinemas, event centers, and nightclubs remain closed, and this will be enforced. For educational activities, daycare and primary schools, all daycares and sc primary schools to remain closed till further evaluation. Schools are encouraged to continue with e-learning and visual teaching, but pupils may proceed to take the national common entrance as soon as is feasible, provided there is compliance with issued non-pharmaceutical interventions. For secondary and tertiary institutions, all schools to remain closed till further evaluation, arrangements to be made for exiting graduating students in JS3 and SS3 to resume at both boarding and day schools as soon as possible for intensive revision exercises. All educational establishments are to conduct exhaustive reviews to ensure compliance with the issued guidelines on COVID-19 before they open up for this purpose. And just to clarify, they will open up only for the purpose of exiting students. Arrangements to be made for students taking part in the NAPTEP and BEC exams, WAEC examinations, NECO and sub exams, respectively. All schools must comply with the six recommended steps and required measures to be issued by the Federal Ministry of Education before an institution is reopened in the timeline to be provided. For churches and mosques, no specific change. Phase two remains. For recreational parks slash communal sports, restriction on communal sports remains and as well as the restriction on recreational parks until further evaluation. For funerals and weddings, no particular change. It's funerals and weddings to be limited to 20 people, including close family members. In summary, the PTF has recommended to Mr. President and Mr. President has approved the extension of phase two of the response with minor modifications. We are requesting for full compliance by the general public. We have to get this right this time round. We really need to stop playing Russian role with our lives uh, because if we continue to expose ourselves to COVID, there's no doubt that people will die. We also call on all the political leaders, the community and religious leaders to continue to support us, the PTF, to make sure that the communities are aware of the risks and compliance is improved. Um, I'll stop here and um, we will take um, any further questions that might arise. Uh, we have uh, ministers from the various um, uh, MDAs that will be happy to take uh, further questions. Thank you. Movement in specific local governments, um, we're still working with the state governments as people would um, obviously realize you cannot um, lock down local governments without working with the states. We have identified these local governments, some of them have uh, issues to do with their location or geographic location and the fact that they do not have defined borders. We will be sending out clarification as soon as we finish this piece of work. The restriction of movement in these local governments is only one of several interventions that we are putting in, uh, in terms of the hotspots. Um, we will be precision targeting these areas, not only to increase testing, but also to improve isolation and to make sure that we do a lot of uh, risk communication and public awareness activities. So the cessation of movement is only part of it 
and some of the local governments may not, it may not be practicable to do so. We already know some local governments that um, will be impossible to enforce this. But overall, what we are trying to do is to put out the small fires across the country, rather than trying to fight a raging fire across the whole country, which will be very difficult and will also be damaging economically for us. So for those areas that we know have very high burden, where the numbers are increasing rapidly, where we have a high positivity rate, we will, we will be introducing specific precision measures, working with the state governments to make sure that we get on top of this. And this will be um, a job that will continue to be reviewed regularly. We expect some local governments to drop after the interventions and some to be added. In terms of uh, opening of interstate travel, whether the state governments have been consulted, yes. We have been working with the state governors. Um, in fact, um, some of the states actually approached us um, towards the end of this phase to specifically request that the borders be opened. As we know, the compliance level in terms of um, um, compliance with the restrictions hasn't been as, um, the percentage compliance hasn't been as high as we would have wanted it to, to be. People who are still traveling. Um, we still continue to maintain um, um, free travel in terms of free movement, in terms of goods and essential travel, even during the, the curfew hours. But we expect people to plan their travel to make sure that wherever you are, certainly the curfew 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. remains. Um, in terms of aviation, somebody was asking why do they need to spend three hours at the airport? Well, you could miss your plane. Anything that um, will not wait for you, it's better you go and wait for it. Um, when it comes to the new normal, and you, people would have seen this on TV, you'll have your temperature checked at the point of entry into the airport. You'll have your temperature checked at the point of boarding. You will have hand sanitization at the point of access to the airport. You'll have hand sanitization when you are boarding the, the, the plane. There, there are so many additional things that have been added. Limitations in terms of physical distancing. We, we cannot have the same number of people in a waiting area. So all these will add up to more time being spent in the airport. So if you don't want to miss your flight, we advise that you get there early. And uh, for domestic flights, certainly the aviation authorities, the advice they are giving is you get there early, preferably up to three hours before your flight. But if you are a last minute person, then good luck. But certainly that's our advice. Um, free movement, okay. The issue of, um, I think I have addressed uh, most of these issues. The other thing is whether, why did we keep the curfew? Well, we're not back to normal. As, you, as stated earlier on by one of the persons asking the questions, the numbers are still going up. There's no doubt about it. Yes, we are testing, but we also know that the level of compliance when it comes to the non-pharmaceutical interventions is not high. So we're still having a raging pandemic. We're still, having, we're still in the exponential phase. So some restrictions will have to remain. And those restrictions that will limit social interactions without affecting severely the economic prospects for the country will remain in place, such as uh, recreational activities, gyms, etc., and such as nightlife. So that's why we've maintained the curfew, because we know that we are not back to normal. We hope that with the extension of the current phase, um, the public would continue to work with us and support us to make sure that we get things done properly, and this time around we get on top of the pandemic. If the pandemic continues to uh, increase as it is, then the PTF will be forced to review some of the measures that we have introduced now. Thank you. I think, uh, let me quickly run through some of well, uh, how I wish the Minister of Aviation were, uh, was here to take the issue about the increase in air tickets. I think there's basically increase on everything. Not only air tickets. If you go to the market now, the prices 
prior to COVID-19 is different from what you get in the market now. That is the difficulty that is going to confront us as a people. And because of the protocols that are going to be introduced in the whole business of uh, aviation, you would definitely expect an increase in the prices. Uh, FAN has already uh, increased uh, its uh, customer services fare with 100%. You used to pay for the customer services, I think it's a thousand naira. Now it's two thousand naira even before the operations start. So it's not only the airlines, even the government institutions who have the responsibility of managing the aviation industry who review their charges because that is the nature of what COVID-19 has thrust on the people of the country and all over the world. I'm also that there is going to be the maintenance of some bit of social distancing on the aircraft. If an aircraft has a capacity of 150 people, they might now be restricted to about 100 or 75. Flying comes with components of course. Aviation fuel is one of it. Salaries for the pilots and the cabin crew is part of it. Services that are paid for to the aviation industry institutions. Every time you see a plane take off, there is an attendant cost to that. Who will bear the cost? It will be shared. It will be shared. The passengers will take part of it. The business owners will take part of the cost. But you know that nobody runs a business at a loss. Profit is the motivation for going into business, isn't it? Flying is not a social service. They will find a way of recouping their money. So we must be prepared for this cost. As to whether government would help the industry, I believe Friday the aviation industry is one of the industries that is hard hit by this COVID-19. Because it's an industry that is designed for moving people up and down. And for the last three months they have not done anything. So I think as part of the intervention of government through either the central bank or the uh, stimulus uh, package in the economic sustainability plan of the 2.3 trillion. I believe the aviation industry would have a part of that. How it is going to be administered, uh, the minister for uh, uh, aviation will be in a better position to explain how that will be administered. There was a question from AIT uh, whether the extension would afford us to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, the, the essence of the extension is to allow us to do a thorough review and consolidate on the gains that have been achieved in the past and to see how we can further drive the message. The message has been basically simple and easy. Bear in mind that there is no cure available. Vaccines are way ahead in terms of availability and procurement. The only message we have for fighting COVID-19 is what I stated this afternoon in my paragraph six where I said, by way of a reminder, there is presently known, known vaccine for the virus and that all over the world, non-pharmaceutical measures still remain the most effective fighting opportunity we have for overcoming this pandemic. That's the only thing you have. So even when we have skewered this extension of four weeks. 
the major agenda of the task force in conjunction with the state governments, the local communities, the leaderships, the religious bodies, the civil societies, and all those that are involved in driving this response will be to make people conscious of the fact that they have to take responsibility. And the only way they can take responsibility is to adhere to the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we have put in place. Simple matters. All over the world, that's the only thing that is working. That's the only thing that is working. As to prescriptions of drugs to be used for the cure. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Everybody is doing trial and error. And that's why you find today is this drug, tomorrow is a different one. We will continue along that trip until a vaccine is discovered or probably a cure is cured. The other question is uh, the experiences of the lockdown of other countries and uh, whether we are learning from those experiences. Uh, Rachel, we are. We've learned from those experiences. We've seen how uh, countries that have even flattened the curve, those that have peaked and flattened the curve, and they relaxed or they eased up on the restrictions. And all of a sudden, they begin to witness resurgence of spikes of infections around certain cities. And that dovetails into the precision lockdown that we are putting in place to take care of that. Because even in this situation now, they don't lock down the entire nation like it was in the past. They go for precision lockdown. A typical example in New Zealand, I think they are locking down a region. In China, as a matter of fact, they are locking down communities so that they can deal with the resurgence that is occurring in those particular places. You see, the irony of our situation is that we have not even picked. We have not even picked. And that is what informed what I said uh, on Thursday last week when I said if it were within my power, I would recommend a lockdown. Because we have not even picked, we are just picking. We are yet to get to the top. I'm not saying this to scare Nigerians, but this is the reality of the fact of the matter. Our figures will grow. Probably by the time we return in a month's time, or within the next uh, four weeks, our figures will not be 24,000. If you look at the modeling and the projections, we will be somewhere around 40, 45,000. That's where we are going to be. But you see, that now drives the home, I mean the point home. That you and I are the ones that are responsible for this thing. We are the ones that are carrying it all over the place. It doesn't go on its own. And we are the only ones that can abet the ferocious nature of the transmission in the communities. As to whether, well, the numbers are growing, why are you allowing for interstate travel? At the end of the day, we in place that because we wanted to restrict people transmitting to the communities. But we found out that it's not working. As a matter of fact, what we succeeded in doing is that we created another enterprise another side business to the extent that it was costing ordinary Nigerians more than necessary to travel illegally from one point to the other because we had an interstate ban. So it was not a, a legal trip if you embarked on it. People were paying so much to embark on those unnecessary in legal trips. Even my good friend in Kaduna, who 
was spending sleepless nights with his deputy and his commissioners manning the borders, realized that it was not working. And like Dr. Sani rightly said, we consulted very well with the state governors. They have tried to ensure compliance and enforcement. It has not worked. Whether it is adversely going to affect our numbers now, I would say scientifically, not much. Because we are already at the community level transmission. Because one infected man comes to into a community where you already have a thousand infections or a hundred infections. Don't do much. So it is very important that we realize that yes, we are learning from the experiences of other countries. Even other can these countries are very disciplined countries. It was something that weighed heavily on us when we were considering what happens with people and students returning back to school to prepare for their exams. We had to wait. It's not an easy decision. But we are mindful of the fact that even prior to COVID-19, we have 50 million children out of school. So what do you do with those that are in school? Do they constitute part of this now? Or do you do something? Measure the risk and see how best you can help the graduating ones. We are not talking about everybody going back to school. It's only the graduating classes in the primary level, primary six. If you don't do something about them, they can't transit to the secondary school level. So they will lose a year. The same thing with JS3. If you don't do anything, because they can only qualify to move if they pass a certain examination. So if we stop them, it means that we would have uh, uh, scuttled uh, the prospect of people graduating to classes. The same thing with SS3. There's a certain examination that qualifies you to go into the university. That's why, in addition to JAM or whatever other qualifications you have, WAIC is not under our exclusive control. The five Anglophone West African countries constitute WAIC. If the other four are ready to start examination, say, in the month of August, Nigeria cannot isolate itself. So it means that the entire people that would have graduated to go to the universities for the next academic year would not be able to graduate. And those are the balances that we took into consideration by saying that, okay, these classes that will be graduated, can we do something to accommodate them in such a way that they will just show up for the purposes of the examination? But prior to that, some of them might want to do revision. Knowing fully well that in the last three months they have been lying, I mean, they've been, I have one in my house, so I know what they are doing. When you come in, they pretend to be busy on their laptops. But immediately you exit, the eight hours you are out of the house, it's a different ball game. I'm a father too, so I know what is happening. You always have stories to tell you of what they did in the, in the, uh, in the day. But we, we were looking at a situation where we would be helpful to them, not to destroy their future, but also to balance it with the risk of their getting infected. So it's, it's a lot of work. And uh, I can assure you that all the gentlemen and the ladies that you see on this side of the divide have had to spend sleepless nights trying to balance this thing so that whatever steps we take will be in an attempt to balance lives and livelihood. Because whether we want to believe it or not, in the last one or two weeks, I think the World Bank and IMF released a report and a projection for which it, 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 it projected that our economy will go into deeper recession. Not deep, deeper recession with a GDP growth rate estimated at minus 5.2 stroke minus 5.5 respectively by December 2020. 
In addition to that, their projection shows that 5 million Nigerians would go into very abject and deep poverty. Yeah? No, 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 95 million. How can it be 95 million? Five, 5 million Nigerians will go into abject poverty if necessary steps are not taken. If necessary steps are not taken. I'm not talking about those that are already there. In addition, as a result of the COVID-19, we already have a high number of those that are already in the bracket. But this is what we will now add to. <laughs> if necessary steps are not taken. So in the whole of the guidelines that we have tried to release, an attempt, a modest attempt is being made by the presidential task force to balance this. And good enough, our president was very proactive when he decided to set up the Economic Sustainability Committee. And that committee has submitted its report. The Federal Executive Council has, has deliberated over it. It's been adopted. It's a 12-month interventionist plan that would project or infuse about 2.3 trillion naira into the economy to create jobs, to sustain businesses in the construction, in the transport, and several other sectors. That's a very good development. And that is what is going to help us as a country to mitigate and moderate the impact of this projection by the World Bank and IMF. The only thing that we will hasten to do is to ensure a speedy implementation. Uh, because it's supposed to be, the lifespan of the, of, the, of the plan is supposed to be 12 months. So within 12 months, we must try as much as possible to infuse the 2.3 trillion naira into the economy. That way, you generate a lot of businesses, a lot of livelihoods that would sustain the economy. In closing, these guidelines are designed to help us as a nation drive our response. My appeal to Nigerians is that, like I said, the only important and known process that will help us in our fight against COVID-19 is to adhere to the non-pharmaceutical interventions. For now, no cure, no vaccine, no drugs. So what do we do? Let's comply with these non-pharmaceutical interventions. Wear your mask in public places. Maintain social distancing. Keep yourself clean through hand washing and sanitizing your hands. Avoid unnecessary travels. Don't congregate in crowded places. If need be, stay at home as much as you can. In my entire 60 plus years of livelihood, I don't think I've ever stayed at home as much as I've done in the last three months. Because my routine is very simple. House, office, villa, meeting venue, back house, office. That's what I've been doing in the last three months. And I will continue as much as possible because I have a responsibility to myself to protect myself and in return, or by extension, protect my family and loved ones. And that is what I urge all of you to do. You have exposed yourselves greatly in the service of the nation. As you continue to do it, please, the watchword word is that you must stay safe. You must try as much as possible to ensure that Whatever happens, at the end of the day, all said and done, you'll be counted as the ones that are standing. Thank you. Have a good evening. It's the document that's been circulated so that you can uh, generate uh, further discourse around it and um, ensure that uh, it's disseminated. Well, as a reminder, Let's just go through a few things. We still have a raging uh, pandemic. The curfew is sustained. We urge you to take responsibility 
We want you to mobilize your community, to create awareness, to wear your mask in public places, await, and stu await study, and adhere to the guidelines to be issued by the education, trans uh, transportation, and aviation sectors. Get our children in critical exam classes ready for their revision and their examinations. You probably have never seen or known anybody who has contracted COVID-19, but COVID-19 is real. As we make our daily plans, we must remember that it is still a threat. You must protect yourself and others from getting sick. This virus has no cure yet, and it does not discriminate. Help to halt the spread, stop the rumors, stop the stigma. Please stay informed. Adhere to the guidelines. They are your fighting opportunities for survival. I thank you very much. God bless Nigeria. We hope to see you next week on Thursday. Thank you.